All right, let's get into another question and answer video. And this one is kombucha induced. So no apple cider vinegar or whiskey or wine or Newcastle ale for this one. Just a little bit of good old kombucha. A good dose of probiotics for you. So let's get into it. First, someone asked, how should fascists in the future limit the leader from betraying the core principles of the fascistic ideal and keep other right-wing members like paleocons and others within the fascist movement in check so they don't split the movement? First, with the leader, um, it's like corruption is, there's no guaranteed way to stop someone from being corrupted, right? If someone wants to be corrupted, they will be corrupted. So, idealistically, in in any kind of, I think, functional, fascistic kind of system, you have your leader, but you also have a council there. And the council is usual, usually responsible for electing the next leader, bringing about the next leader as well. And, you know, possibly even people from that council will go on to be leader, you know, etc. So idealistically, you'd want that council to stay true to the core principles of the ideology. So if they see that the leader is swaying from that, taking bribes, uh, doing things for himself, whatever it may be, that um, they would expose that. And once that's exposed, that it'd be dealt with swiftly, and you know, if, if it's provable. So you, you would hope, once again, it, there's oversight over business, over education, over media. There's oversight over the leader as well. So it, it's upon that oversight um, to make the people aware, if they're not already aware, that there's corruption or wrongdoing going on with the leader. And then be replaced for that. Obviously, a, a method, a process will be set up of how to replace a leader if, if they've gone wrong and, and how to prove that a leader's gone wrong. So I, I, I think that's one of the best safeguards you can have is, is a council that's there. And, and that's, um, but outside of that, you can't stop anyone from becoming corrupted. And at worst case scenario, I would imagine like we look today and most of us would agree. We hate this system, whether you're a communist, whether you're a fascist, whether you're a libertarian, whether you're an anarchist, whatever you are, you hate that you don't like this system, right? For whatever numerous reasons, but yet the system remains in power. Why? Because you know, let's face it, we're comfortable. We don't want to sacrifice. We don't want to go through the hard times, um, and all these things. So, it, with a list of other things, and and main point is we're weak. We're not masculine as a people. We're not, and and so we're not going to do masculine things like die for causes and have greater visions and fight for them and unify over them and, and blaze forward. We're not going to do that. At least not yet. Right. Well, we got, this is why I'm always like harping on self-improvement and uh, re-embracing masculinity and masculine virtues. I think this is vital. You know, to, no, I don't give a fuck. You can point the finger out. Oh, these people, these people, it doesn't mean you're going to do shit about those people. Right. So, so idealistically, now we have a society where you have people who have been molded like that in their education and their media and all of that stuff. They're molded to be, you know, more decent, more courageous, more honorable, more virtuous people. And when you have people like that, they're more likely to rebel against a corrupt system. Let's say like not only the leaders corrupt, but the council is corrupt and this is corrupt and that's corrupt. People who are healthy physically, mentally and spiritually are much more likely to rebel. So it, it goes upon a citizen. Now, as far as keeping the um, paleocons and all that, this is a good question because this has been a problem forever in, in the modern age of fascism. It, it happened in Germany with the aristocracy. It happened in Italy with the aristocracy, right? And it, it pretty much happens everywhere with the aristocracy whenever fascism takes over. So it's, um, yeah, th that is a problem that has to be dealt with because they're cowards, uh, th these people, paleocons and people like that. Like I just watched uh, Jeff Sessions. Um, uh, he was on trial. And I remember like Alex Jones and, and, and maybe Cernovich, maybe all these people in, in the alt light that were, um, you know, shilling real hard for, for Trump. And, and you know, I, I mean, not shilling for the, the ideal of Trump like I was, but 
shilling for the person, Trump, right? And they were all happy with Sessions. Oh, Sessions is great. And, you know, Sessions is a cuck, right? What does he do? He recuses himself when he's supposed to be fighting for Trump. And then they asked him today, Rosenstein or whatever, um, his chosen uh, um, secretary is or second in charge, whatever his title was, he's involved with the uranium deal where the Russians got, uh, what, 20% of our uranium through the Obama administration and, and even gave kickbacks to the Clinton Foundation, which is which is all in the book, um, Clinton Cash. So they, um, anyways, they asked him today, should Rosenstein recuse himself because he's going to be involved in this and because he, would, he took part in, in the deal uh, of giving the uranium to the Russians. And sessions like well you know that's up to him it's total cuck the paleo cons are, are pussies right they are that, that's why the liberals that's why these faggy limp-wristed pink-haired motherfuckers seem all tough to them and are scaring them and making them change their directions because they're pussies they're pussies so being that they're pussies of course if this fascistic nationalistic movement grows and, and people get onto it th- they will play the role but they will secretly they'll team with the liberals they'll team with you know whoever internationalists to take it down. So um, you have to know these people. You have to be vigilant against them and put them up against the wall when you find them. And, and you know what happens when you get put up against the wall, right? So, I mean, that's what has to, has to happen. You have to route them out. You can't let these people hide because we've learned from history. You know, I'd, I would like to give a more PC answer, but we've learned from history. There are some people that are just going to be corrupt. There are some people that are just going to attack a system that they can't benefit in, and they're going to seek to subvert it from the inside. Soon as you find that out, no mercy, no fucking mercy. And so that's what we do with the paleocons and anyone else that tries to subvert once power is taken. Put them up against a wall. That's it. And that's the only answer. I'm not just giving a hard, unrealistic or callous answer. I, I, I don't want it to come across like that. I'm giving an answer that comes from history. Where's um, the painting on my wall? Where are we at? Caesar stabbed to death by the people he showed mercy to. We got to learn from history, people. We got to learn from history. So people could not completely agree with the system and just work and do it. Just like today, right? A lot of people don't agree with the system. But they still go to work and they still contribute to it. So sure, you'll have people like that. You'll probably have a lot of people like that. But people who actively try to subvert, that's a no-no. There's no mercy for that, and there shouldn't be. And once again, when we're talking about masculinity, uh, we're talking about a uh, hardening of man once again. So these solutions, why they seem like, oh, you know, it's so evil and so bad right now, they become a lot more natural and, and you know, acceptable when our mentality changes. So that's how I think they should be dealt with. It, it, first sign, first sign of treachery. There's there's no excuse. So that's my answer to that. Next question. Um, so my video, someone was commenting underneath my video when I was talking about parenting. And they said, preceding having kids, preceding having kids though, is a woman to have is a woman to have with him. Could you make a video on that? I straight up have dated I straight up haven't dated in three years, mostly because my life wasn't in order until recently, but also because a lot of them were just trampy, trampy. Yes, a lot of them are. So my personal experience, um, hmm, how to say this without insulting my wife, because my wife is pretty, but uh, if you want to be happy for the rest of your life, make an ugly woman your wife, right? You've heard that. It's a song. It's a saying. And... What what it what it's meaning? How I take its meaning is, if you're solely looking at looks for the person you want to breed with, the person you want to make your wife, the the woman you fall in love with, you're setting yourself up for failure. You're setting yourself up for failure. There has to be more, right? There has to be more. So if, if a woman is a little more homely than the other one, but her qualities as a nurturer, as a mother, and a, as a woman outshine the beautiful woman. To me, that's the easy choice. Like I can lust over the, the beautiful woman, but what I know is going to be a better person of the family unit is is going to be uh, the woman with the better qualities. So I, um, I've always had that mentality, and and well, I shouldn't say always had that mentality. But when I looked into ha- having a family and all that, that was the main thing. I, I looked for the qualities that I appreciated in a woman. So 
these days, yeah, it is. It, it's hard to find a decent girl. And I thought it was for me too, because even, you know, 10 years ago, you know, 11, 12 years ago, when I, when I met well, my wife, we're at college and women were just as trampy at college then as they are now. And, you know, my wife was a uh, Catholic school girl, played the cello, played the cello like fanatically, like was in the local orchestra and all that stuff. So she had much of her life dedicated to that. She only had three boyfriends before me and only had sex with two of the boyfriends before me. So th- these were um, it, good signs for me. This is how I already knew like, oh, this is good. This is good. Uh, nurturer. She was getting going into the medical industry, taking care of people. So all, all these things, kind of, all these signs kind of pointed to and and then you know she accepted me for who i was how she met me funny enough i was i was a real fuck up in college like and i always recommend people not to do that and not to be politically motivated in college and i fucked up my whole college uh you know i spent years there got a bunch of credits but never finished anything because i was just constantly fighting dropping classes and taking classes feeling persecuted uh feeling picked on because of the papers i was writing the shit i was wearing so long story short i was, I was I used to wear this rudolph hess uh, prisoner of war prisoner of peace uh, shirt a lot and um, they were sitting behind me, and it was in one of our English classes. And her friends like that dude got a fucking Nazi on his shirt, right? It was I'm sitting in the front, and they're like in the back. And then, so she's at first like, "What, really? You know, that's weird." And we kind of got grouped together. Uh, me, uh, my my future wife, the friend that, that pointed out there was a Nazi on my shirt, and all this. And we had a project we had to do, so we met like that, and we started talking, and, and then we got along. And then, you know, I had to tell her, like, I had two big disclosures I had to give her. A, one, I'm an ex-felon. B, hey, and at that time, I was I was active white nationalist. That, hey, I'm a Nazi. So, like, these were two. And, and telling and being like, hey, I'm a Nazi was even the bigger <laughs> disclosure than, hey, I, I was ex-felon. Because that's, you know, that's like right there with child molester in mainstream society, right? It, so, it's, um, so she accepted that and, and she doesn't agree with all of my views and, and she didn't agree definitely at that time. And, and funny enough, like I I'd give her like all these uh, as like w- when I finally, you know, made my mind up and got out of white nationalism. Um, it was like the straw that broke the camel's back is like, I'd spend all this time, like, you know, the media, Jewish media, they, they give you a wrong image of these people. These are good people, blah, 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 and all this. And I kind of know I'm half ass lying in the back of my head because I know a lot of these people. And while they they might inside be good people. They they just weren't outside because they didn't you know seek to change themselves. So we go to this party and it was uh, skinheads from Purdue in, in Las Vegas and, and local white nationalist people from the National Vanguard in Vegas and we're at this big party and sure enough, man, there was two stabbings. Had to break up two stabbings and and real fucking stabbings. People going to the hospital, cops coming, fights. Bunch of brawls broke up between the California and Las Vegas games. It was gangbangers. That's all it essentially was. So, boom, wild fucking night, breaking up fights, stopping people, stopping other people from pulling knives and guns and all this shit. And I'm going from breaking up one fight to another. And and then, like, what really fucking really got my nerve was one of the people from National Vanguard came over, and he was, like, a big money funder. He was in realty, and he, there was a couple times Las Vegas had made the news. Once they put up a billboard, and I think it was, like, 2004, and about immigration and then another time with the white people's party and, and both things were like thanks to this guy and the money he put into it right and he was the, the local unit leader of the national vanguard and you know he comes to the party like all the local scene does and some skinhead chicks yelling and screaming at him and i had to get in between them and and, and she's just flailing I, I don't know why you know she was attacking him but it's just like god damn man these people man they're and so this whole thing of trying to sell her, like, oh, no, the media is not telling you right. And then she sees everything the media portrays, like, playing out right in front of her eyes. So she never got into that shit. And, and she was never political. And I appreciated that in a woman. I, a lot of people look for women to be on par with them. I, I don't. I, I don't want to argue at the table about, you know, the finer qualities of esoteric fascism with my wife. Don't fucking want to do it. Don't want to do enough of it on people with people online. Don't want to have to deal with it at the dinner table, right? So... It's it's we have our different interests. Uh, the only time she ever got political was this election because she saw I was getting into the Trump thing, so she jumped on too. And you know she's supportive of everything, but 
it's it didn't I, I didn't look for we uh, you have to be super beautiful we have to be you know on the same page with everything I look for qualities of are are you a good nurturer are you a good person are are you not a whore and and, and it's like it's finding these things in a woman I think you'll find uh, someone who's not a tramp who's not a whore but you, you have to know the qualities you're looking for and and being a good nurturer should be one of them because because you want that. As, as any kind of mother figure in your kid's life, when you plan on having kids and stuff like that, are they a good nurturer? And, and that's, uh, was a big, big, big part of being fine with actually breeding with this woman and creating kids and having her in my life for the rest of my life. So it's, it went a long way and, and, and it's looking at those qualities. I wouldn't recommend, um, like I said, trying to find your, 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 you know, ideal and it's fine you find a girl that's ideologically on par with you good more power to you i know some people who have girls like that and it works out fine i know other people who had girls like that and it didn't work out fine so you know i mean it is what it is but you have to i think the main thing should be a nurturing quality within the woman and and loyalty loyalty is a big thing and that can only be proven through uh you know trials and tribulations right but if you can see they have a decent character at first, then most likely they're, if you're a decent man, they'll have loyalty to you. So that's, that's a big important thing. But I mean, just on face value, the nurturing quality of a woman is something that's how, you know, if she's going to be a good mother, a good wife, and, and, and just essentially a good woman. So th- that to me was a big part. And I saw that in um, my wife, even, you know, 10, 12 years ago, but, it's uh, and and it proved out. Like I said, we don't agree on everything. We get into arguments here and there, very rarely actually, but uh, you know here and there. But it's uh, you know I don't like some of the shit she watches or does and all that. She's you know kind of stuck in mainstream. It's um, I remember we were watching like she's a big Harry Potter fan, and we we're watching and we finally went through like I went through the series with her finally, just like a year ago, and we're watching it. And I was, I, was, I was kind of talking to my daughter because we're, anytime we watch movies, we kind of look at where is the message? What's it saying? And um, I was, uh, we, were, we were talking about this. They're going for this angle in, in Harry Potter. Um, and I was explaining it to my daughter and my wife just fucking, she just snapped. She goes, don't fucking ruin Harry Potter for me too. And I was like, whoa. Like, calm down, you know, you can enjoy it still. Just, you know, know, you know, when the messages are being in place, you can still enjoy it. You know, you can have your cake and eat it too. But uh, just there's nothing wrong with pointing out the propaganda. There's nothing wrong with that. So, yeah, we don't agree on everything. But um, the qualities, the nurturing qualities, the qualities of a loyal woman, qualities of just overall good character, someone who actually just gives a fuck. Um, uh, we're, we're all there. And to me, that was the most important thing, more so than looks, more so then um, are you ideologically on par with me and stuff like that? More so than that, it was a nurturing quality. So that's that, that's the only advice I can give to you. I'm not a I'm not a you know expert on women. Sorry, it's you know uh, what I spent ten years incarcerated, you know, and by the time I'm twenty five, maybe by the time I was twenty five, I had ten years already incarcerated by then. So. Many of the years where I could have been sowing my wild oats, I wasn't. So, but from my, my limited experience, it, it's been um, it's been looking for the, the nurturing. And she was the first one I ran across. I, I ran across whores, and I used the whores for what they were for. Fucking right, I, I did that. I met girls that were easy. Oh no, let's meet up. Oh, I'm not gonna fuck you, but let's meet up, and then you're fucking them at the end of the night, right? It's the same old thing, but. It's, it, it, but you could tell, right? You know, right there, this, she, oh, if I can fucking talk her out of her panties in day one, how many other guys have done that, right? So, and then you can also see that um, they're lacking in some qualities in other places, especially in their nurturing aspect. And this is the feminism attacks this quality of nurturing in women. So I, I think, you know, it's on top of playing the cello being a you know a catholic school girl and all this stuff these were kind of good things for me too especially playing the cello i, I can do without the catholic school girl stuff but because you know they could go real bad too as we know but uh playing the cello and being like fanatically into the cello that that was a good sign for me too so um yeah that, that's it <laughs> look for a chick that plays classical musical instrument instruments and is going into the medical industry that's all, that's all i can tell you because that's how it worked for me so next question 
do you really think getting involved in the current political offices is going to help our cause? Question mark. I'm not being rhetorical. I just think it's odd that you suggest it considering that all I've read and know seems to imply that our current politics are so corrupt that all efforts would be worthless. After getting involved or, say, winning an election, what is the next logical step, in your opinion, to bring forth the results we want? Okay, so let's break it down. Should we get involved in political? Yeah, I, this is, I've been preaching this for years. And I even tried to reach out. I went onto the alt-right forum, TRS, even though against my better judgment, and tried to meet local people because I was going to the Republican Party meetups and I saw that it was, um, it was there for the taking. If we can just get like... 10 young people to show up and get aggressive and speak good and all this, you can get fronted. They were, they were telling me when I went there and all the times I spoke to these people, Oh my, my God, we need, we need younger people. We need younger people. And, and we need more people like you. Do you know more people like you that show up? And unfortunately I didn't that, that were politically active. So I, I desperately went out to the, cause I remember when I first came back to Vegas, uh, how do I find the local white nationalists? You go on Stormfront. And so now, you know, I've been so out of that world for a while. I was like, how do I find anyone that's close ideologically with me? Oh, the TRS form. So I go try to find local people. And what do, I, what do you expect when you go to a form that's, they're all about trolling, right? You met, I met a bunch of trolls, pussies. Yeah, we have book clubs and pool parties. Oh, cool. Let's meet up. Let's take some real political action. Oh, oh, I'm busy. I'm busy all the time. Oh, matter of fact, I, I can't ever answer you again because I'm so busy, right? That's, that's the mentality. There's, there's too many... Uh, there's too much shit right now. I'm not. Even, I just, I'm feeling anger just coming about that. Uh, just thinking about like how weak and impotent these people are. Because I saw that one of the people I was speaking to, like he's on the TRS form. He has like you know five thousand posts on there, uh, every day bitching. It's like you faggot. You know, I gave you the chance to actually take action. Well, you, you want to know part of it, but you know, hide behind Pepe and talking about people in anonymity. Oh, you're all about that. So there's too much of that. But anyways, back to the political. It's a must. It's it's a must because these fringe groups unite the right and, and all these little failed attempts at anything don't accomplish anything. We have to run for office. Even if you fail, you have to run for office because you're getting your message out there to more and more people. And, and this helps. And maybe you'll get more and more people. Trump opened the door to this. This is the beauty about Trump. We saw there was you can speak on a nationalistic, uh, traditionalist kind of message and and a little more masculine of a message and there's a there's a group of people out there that are yearning for this message and trump was the first step in the right direction now we need a bunch of us in every state running for positions not these dummies crying about jews and blacks and all this shit go on and shoot yourself in the foot right if that's what you're going to do it's been done over and over and over and over again how many people with that message have run for office and just been you know, laughed at. Not going to work. If you're speaking on what we saw Trump touch on, if you speak on these, you know, nationalistic core principles, the, the crowd is there. The people are there. So that's why I think we need to go down that realm. And, and that's something I'm going to have to personally end up doing, unfortunately, within the next decade, for sure. Because unless something else comes around, you know, I have to, whether, you know, I, I you know, swing and strike out, I'm still going to try to fucking hit a home run. But, um, and, and more and more people should be like that too. And I'm trying to meet more and more people that are, are getting on page with that too. And, and, you know, maybe we can talk and, you know, kind of get a message together. So people are running on kind of same platforms, but I think it, it's vital that we do that. Now, what do you do if we win? Here's the big thing. You can't go in there and play within the rules of the system, and get anywhere. We know that you'll get drowned out. You'll get drowned by the swamp. So, um. What do you do? How do you change it? Well, it has to be a populist revolution. Because we're not just talking about running for any political party. Oh, he's kind of like a Republican, but he's this. No, this is revolutionary politics. It's what it has to be. It's a revolutionary message. And it's it, it's invoking that spirit in people too. So the only way, I think, the only realistic way, because... You can't battle the military. You can't battle the police. You can't do it. And they will battle you because especially if you're on some fringe bullshit message, especially if you're on that, because they get paid by the system and their number one priority, like most of your number one priorities is putting food in the belly and food on the table for the family. Okay. 
And I'm not knocking it, but let's be real. That is everyone's number one priority. Because if it wasn't, we'd all be sacrificing our lives for our cause right now, right? Right? So that's number one priority for everyone. So being that's the case, how do we get around that? How do we work with that? How do we use that to our advantage? Well, it has to be a populist movement, right? A fanatical populist movement, not a fringe movement, a populist one. So it's speaking to these nationalistic tones that you can get this populist movement. So once you have this populist movement, you are physically going to have to use the population, the people, the supporters. The police will not shoot. The military will not shoot. They will support it in the end. If it's a populist movement, they will not turn against the people like that. And I've used this example before. Like they crushed out all the alt-riders at, at the Charlottesville thing, shoved them down with their shields. Get the fuck out of here, punks. We don't want you here, right? That's what they did to them. That's what they did. And did they do that with Trump supporters ever? No. They never would, too. Because it's a completely different story, right? Even though it was called Nazi, fascist, racist by the media and by the left all the time, it wasn't. And the mili- and most of the military and the police were even on the side of Trump. So, you know, it's the same with this. So they won't shoot on the citizens that are like that. And wh- what do we do? We drag out every fucking senator and congressman out of their seats. Get the fuck out of here. Maybe we charge them. I don't know, right? Who knows? Maybe we should, you know, just say, get the fuck out of here. Get out of here and, and never come back. And we reelect those positions. I don't think you could change the whole, you know, I would like to change the whole structure of it. But I, I, I don't know. I guess it depends what's going on, right? We're, we're talking about this hypothetical future right here. But let's just look at it pragmatic as we can. You get those people out and you, and, and you hold re-elections and there's no political campaigning. There's just town halls. We kind of use Gaddafi's method, method in a way in the Green Book. We use these town halls to elect people and there, there is no political donations. There's only or, or you know people using money in advertisements. There's only people going to these town halls and speaking on their platform of, of, you know, they will support this message, this system and all that. And if someone's getting elected on, on a nationalistic, fascistic, you know, populist message, then the people on, on in the parliamentary level will also be getting elected on that too. So people who embrace those values in the town halls will be going into there. And now we have a whole new Congress, a whole new Senate of people who actually give a fuck and want to move forward, of people who are not uh, being corrupted by money. Then, of course, you have to start making things where you're, you're going to stop people from having the opportunity to be corrupted. And so I, I think that's the only realistic way we go about it. You have to have a populist overthrow. That's it. Because, like I said, you're not beating, it's not going to be guerrilla action. It's not going to be military. I'm sick of tough talking guys, especially at the white nationalist scene. Sick the fucking death of it, okay? Uh, been around for a little bit, all right? Seen a lot for a little bit. You know who else has been around for a little bit? All you tough guy, killer white nationalists out there? Tom Martinez. He's been around for a little bit too, in public too, right? And, uh, you know, all these people talk about 48, uh, or no, 48, 1488 and all this. Uh, you know, uh, the people that coined those words, you know, died in prison, uh, uh, old age and crazy, David Lane. Matthews uh, died to death, burning in a house, in a tub, right? And the person that turned him in, Tom Martinez, running around doing shows all the time. All these killers, right? All these tough guys, all these Rahoa types, all these, we're going to do this and this and that. Yeah, yeah. You let that punk run around. So I'm, I'm not <laughs> I'm not buying your stories about Rahoa and when his shit hits the fan, man, all this shit. No, it needs to be a populist overthrow. And that's what it's going to be. That's the only way it's going to work. You're going to have to drag the people out. And it's going to have to be through the population of the people. Because anything else, the military will fire on it. The military will stop you. The police will stop you. But if it's by the people, for the people, the military and the police are the people too. And they won't do that. They'll support that. They won't fire on their citizens for these senators even if their bosses tell them so. They'll start arresting their bosses. Because, hey, they have job security because they got someone in office that's going to support them more than they have ever been supported. And that'll be clear to them as well. So it, it, it's how it, it's run upon. It, this is why this is so important. This is why creating an ideology and, and, and speaking rightly at it is so vital. And this is why I, I just keep repeating, identitarian politics is losers for everyone, for everyone, for blacks, for whites, for browns, for yellows, for purples, all of you. It's a losing method. Why do you think they started the NAACP and all these all these identitary things that went against that was a counterculture at the time? 
Why do you think they did this? Because identity politics creates, in, in a nation like this, nothing but tearing at each other's throats. Why the powers that be continue to be the powers that be. All right? no, no one's got the time to worry about where the society is going as a whole because we're too busy worried about our own subgroup interests. And it's not a winning thing. It's not a winning thing in the society. It's not. So it, it has to be popular statement. It's like I said, you're not defeating the military. You're not. It doesn't matter. You're not doing it. You're not defeating the police. You're not doing it. And if you're a fringe group talking about separatism and all this other shit, guess what? They're going to crush you like they've been doing, like they do every time. So it has to be a populist movement. And, and then you have to eject all the people that are in office right now from top to bottom. It's, it's going to be a, a period of reconstruction for sure. And, you know, maybe things will be rocky, you know, for the first year or two. I, who knows? But these are changes that must happen because just winning anything uh, a position in the government it's nothing nothing a ask uh, uh jose primo how that worked out for him yeah you know and Kadrianu, how did it work out for you guys getting a couple seats in there it didn't work out too good you know what worked out good um when uh hitler took over the whole system oh yeah then you can make your rules right then you can do what you want to do then you can create the society that we desire. Then you can do that. Right? You can't do that with one person and, or, or five to ten people, you know, in the parliamentary process. Just can't do it. So I think that's the method that needs to take. It needs to be a populist thing, a populist revolt. I think it could be largely, although violence will happen, largely nonviolent in the way it happens. Uh, because it kind of needs to be, because if it gets too violent, then police and military might be able to be coaxed into suppressing it. So, although on certain levels, violence will happen. It just always does. Uh, it's kind of unavoidable. So that's my thoughts on that, right? I, I, I don't know. People have more realistic, pragmatic ways forward than they need to be getting out there with it. But I'm tired of the same old shit. When shit hits the fan, oh, people are going to do this. Oh, for my cold, dead hands. I'm so tired of the rhetoric. God damn, I'm so tired of it. I'm getting old, getting old, closer to death, listening to people's empty words. I don't, uh, I don't want to hear it. If you're one of those people, grow up or fuck off. Okay. This is your only two options. I don't want to hear anything else. Grow up or fuck off. Or go do it. <laughs> There's three options. So, you know, it, it, it'd be a fucking lonely death. Maybe some RAC band will make a song about you. And, you know, that's all you want out of life. But, um, no. We, we got to win this whole game. And, and we're not going to do it by childish fantasies. Uh, this populist overthrow, I think, is the best chance we have. And I didn't think we even had this chance a couple years ago until the Trump thing happened. And then I'm like, oh, shit. Oh, shit. There are people out there. There's a whole base out there, not just Republican cucks, right? Because Trump went through the whole Republican Party and, and, and you know, defeated all the heavyweights in the Republican Party. So there's a real thing out there that can be tapped into. And these other the all right fucked up like they had the chance. They had the chance. I, I really believe if, if they kept it um, innately white, the message, but not exclusively white. Like it could have caught on a lot more than it has, right? But you know, they they dropped the ball. So it's, people are going to be happy with. I think a lot of people are just happy with making a living, like doing the Alex Jones method. Make a living bitching about the things you like to bitch about, and having people support you and donate to you. Too many people get comfortable with that. It seems like, and I think a lot of people just have that motive. Hey, I can just troll and do podcasts and tell people donate to my Patreon and, and just get through life like that. Fuck that shit, man. I don't want your Patreon. I, I, don't, I don't want your memes, your jokes. I, I fucking want a society worth living in. I want a society that progresses. I want a society that tries to achieve beautiful and fantastical things. All right? So I'm tired of all this other shit. You got to be populist revolt. Okay. Um, last one. When I think of historical cases of fascists coming to power, I realize I don't fully understand how they did it in the bureaucratic political sense. I understand the will of the people explanation, but not the actual steps. I guess my question could be answered if I looked it up <laughs> now that I type it out. But if you have any words of suggestion, I'd like to hear, I'd like to read them. Um, Oh, steps forward. Well, that's that. That's what kind of what I was just talking about here. You see, I, I see these questions and uh, like, oh, like, oh, I'll answer this in a video, and I, I put it down on, on on you know, copy and paste it. And I don't look at it again until I answer the questions. Maybe I should do a little more brushing up before I do that. 
But um, this, this is just the continuing of, of the last question I asked. But the steps forward is, is that, is what I'm talking about. We, there needs to be a nationalistic, populistic message going there. And, and it, can't, it can't be identitarian, racially identitarian based. It can't be. Because to white nationalist thinking, you're just magically going to wake up white people. That's not going to happen. They'll be repulsed by an exclusively white racialist message. They will. You you lose. I white nationalists always complain to me, or or, or saying, "Oh, you're a cuck," or or you don't care about white people, or you don't care about this. Like, no. What I'm talking about is going to attract more white people than what you're talking about. You know. So that's how I look at it. And then it's going to attack or attract um, quality people of other races as well. That's going to contribute to it as well. And then get their people also to see the bigger picture of things. So it's it's that's the step. There needs to be a whether it's done individually, and I, I've spoken about this before, like a think tank needs to be created, like a real think tank where we go meet and, and, and speak and hammer these things out. So so people who are willing to step forward, willing to put their names, faces out there, real, willing to run for positions, get together and form a, a base ideology of, of, of standards and things we run on and speak to the people with and how to package it to where it's palatable to the people. And these things need to be figured out for sure. Of course, I have my own ideas as an individual. And then worst case scenario, you know, five to 10 years from now, if I have to run for some local position, I'm going to have to run off of my personal things and what I can concoct personally and how I can package it personally, right? Hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully uh, something else has come around by then where it's worthy of joining and I can get involved in that. Or there's going to be other people also and there's a kind of a uniformed ideology that we're working towards and we're speaking to people with because the opportunity is there. It is there. And it's not uh, anyone that knows me like personally, personally knows me over the years would probably tell you I was more pessimistic than anything else. And I always took like the Spangler view of bold pessimism. Right. And now it's like, I'm trying to stop myself from becoming the optimist. Cause I use, I view a lot of optimists as cowards because like, Oh, everything's great. Everything's going to work out great. Roho and all this, blah, blah, blah. And it, it, it just coaxed them into doing nothing. Right. But now it's like, I see so much opportunity. It, it's like all the signs are there that opportunity is there for the seizing. It's only our fault. We don't deserve it. If we don't seize it, we don't deserve it. So I, I don't, I, I may feel bad. Like, Hey, my kids are growing up in, in the society that's declining, continuing to decline. But I can't say we deserve better if we don't take it, I, you know, so I can't say that. So I, I guess when push comes to shove, we'll see what we're really about, right? And if we can't form an ideology, if we can't get together as, as citizens and realize uh, despite our ethnic differences, despite our religious differences uh, that we have uh, shared destiny in this country, then we're fucked then, you know, just give it up to the globalists, give it up to the capitalists, give it up to the big corporations, uh, you know, give it up to the chosenites because it's their game and they deserve it. If we can't seize it, they deserve it. Right. And it's the opportunity is there for, to seize right now. It's, it, it's not as draconian. It's not as lost hope as, as it looked just years ago. Cause we see there's a base out there that's willing to listen to a nationalistic hard line message. And Trump's is just, just the beginning. It's going to get more hard lined as the next people come around. And, and hopefully we're that next people, right? Or people like us are those next people. And that's the hope. That's the goal. Because although we have opportunity right now, and I'd say maybe for the next 10 years, we got opportunity that door will close and there will become a time where it's too late. So once again, it'd only be on us. So I, I think if, if we're individually doing stuff, you need to learn how to package uh, what you're speaking about and, and, and control yourself. And I got a problem with that too. I can easily go off the rails. I can easily get angry at someone and, and just fucking, ah, fuck you then, you know, and go right down that road. So it's like working on all those things to control, as I keep talking about self-betterment, uh, that's what I have to be completely physically, mentally, and spiritually in tune before I go plunge into that world because God, the, the shit I'm going to put on my family, my whole extended family and all that, uh, when, if, when, and if I have to do that. Yeah. It, it, that it's, it's fuck. It could be real fucked up shit, especially if I'm doing it alone or if it's just me and five other people, you know, running on some stuff that we're just going to get slayed on. That's, um, but that's something you have to be prepared for. So hopefully by that time, be more uniformed, be more, you know, serious people out there who are, who are seriously looking for pragmatic solutions to move forward. And, and if that's the case, then, you know, we have a better shot. If not, 
then we have to do it as individuals in our own areas and, and do the best we can and represent our views and ourselves the best we can. And, and that's vital. And I, I think those are our only, way, our only steps forward, right? I can give you some fake ass answers. Hey, let's start an internet party. Let's, let's join this other internet party. Let's, uh, you know, go troll this reporter on Twitter. Uh, let, let's just say Rahoa and the time will come and they, this can't last forever. Shit's going to hit the fan. And I can give you all those answers all day long, man, but it's not real, man. It's not true. It's not true. So the, the only truth is we improve ourselves. We improve our society if we desire to do so. And, and that's the battle everyone should take right now. You should make the decision to make yourself a better man. You should make yourself more in tune with our heroes of the past. Try to live up more to their ideals and don't beat yourself up every time you make a mistake. Just get back on the horse and keep going. Right? That's what we have to do. And then we have to start figuring out how are we going to step forward politically? How are we going to present ourselves? Who are we even? Right? All these things need to be figured out. So it's... um. That's it. I'm ranting. We're going on 40 minutes here. So I'll stop with the ranting. Get full of kombucha and probiotics. I just want to fucking keep going. But we'll have to stop now. Um, yeah, that's it. I hope I touched on all points. I know I ranted and rambled a little bit here and there. But hopefully I touched on all the points of all the questions. Until next time. Cheers, fellas. <laughs>